Okay, in this video we're going to talk about equilibrium and hearing. Uh, equilibrium is balance and hearing is hearing. And uh, you find the structures that are involved in both of these processes within the ear. Now we can divide the ear into three distinct anatomical regions where you have an external, a middle, and an inner ear. And we can see those regions here on this next slide. Now what's shown in kind of blue here is the external ear. It's going to contain things like the auricle, which is the main part of the ear here, and your external acoustic meatus, which is the outer ear canal, as well as part of your tympanic membrane or eardrum. Now the middle ear is this region shown in kind of pink, and the middle ear is going to contain really this sort of air-filled cavity, which has again the tympanic membrane but the other side of it that's a, that's a, associated with the auditory ossicles which are a series of bones here that transmit vibration for sound as well as the opening to the pharyngeo tympanic tube also called the auditory tube or eustachian tube um, this tube is basically an elastic tube that connects from the middle ear to the nasopharynx which is the back part of your nasal cavity to help, uh, to help equalize pressure between the middle ear and the nasopharynx. Now, the inner ear is really a bony labyrinth that's within the temporal bone. And the inner ear is what contains the sensory structures that are necessary for things like equilibrium as well as hearing. And we'll go into more detail on the structures of the vestibule and cochlea. Now basically what you find within these, the vestibule and cochlea are nerve endings that are specialized for basically balance and hearing. And those are, going to, those are going to transmit action potentials along the vestibulocochlear nerve, which then connects to the brain regions, which allow you to be conscious of things like balance and hearing. Now we'll first start here with the external ear. We talked about how the auricle is just sort of the elastic part of your ear elastic cartilage. Uh, that leads to an external acoustic meatus, which is sort of the outer ear canal, and that ends at the tympanic membrane or eardrum. Now within the external acoustic meatus, there are uh, little glands that secrete a, something called cerumen, which is basically like earwax. Now these ceruminous glands, which secrete cerumen, uh, they're basically modified sebaceous glands which create earwax um, because it's wax it's hydrophobic or water fearing it can help repel water and keep uh, you know water from staying inside of your external acoustic meatus and thus prevent infection now the middle ear we talked about as being that sort of air cavity just deep to the tympanic membrane uh, it's going to have your auditory ossicles, which include things like your malleus and your incus and your stapes. These are, these are the smallest bones in the body, but their function is to basically help transmit uh, vibrations to the cochlea, which you can basically transduce into sound. Now, the middle ear is also connected to something called the auditory tube or eustachian tube or pharyngeotympanic tube, which helps equalize pressure from the middle ear to the nasopharynx. That way it prevents too much pressure from building up and potentially damaging structures in the middle ear. Now we can see the middle ear structures in finer detail on this slide where we can see the auditory ossicles. We have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Uh, some other words for these bones are the mallet, the anvil, and the stirrup because they, they kind of look like those structures. Now these bones are uh, basically all connected together and they're also connected to some different types of skeletal muscle, like tensor tympani and stapedius. Now, what this muscle does, and it's actually some of the uh, few examples of involuntary skeletal muscle in the body, but what these muscles do is they basically help control the ability of these bones to vibrate. So if these muscles are contracted, it's harder for these auditory ossicles to vibrate. If these muscles are relaxed, it's easier for the oss ossicles to vibrate. And what I mean by vibrate is that when sound waves come through the external acoustic meatus, they're going to bounce off the tympanic membrane and cause that to vibrate, which causes the malleus to vibrate, that causes the incus to vibrate, which causes the stapes to vibrate, and that causes fluid here within the vestibule to vibrate, 
which travels along and is eventually transduced into sound. Now we can see the opening to the auditory tube. Again, this is to help equal, equalize pressure from the middle ear to the nasopharynx and vice versa, which prevents too much pressure from building up in here and potentially damaging the tympanic membrane or other nearby structures. Now the inner ear exists within a bony labyrinth within the temporal bone. In fact, there's the petrous part of the temporal bone, which is sort of the large bony ridges inside of the cranial cavity, which contain this bony labyrinth. And it turns out that the inner ear is all within that bony labyrinth. And what I mean by bony labyrinth, they're basically a series of large uh, convoluted spaces within the temporal bone that house some of the structures that are involved with equilibrium and hearing. Now, those structures that are involved in equilibrium and hearing, we call the membranous labyrinth. And um, these have uh, fluid-filled spaces, as well as nerve endings that are involved in transducing things like balance and hearing. Now, what this looks like then is if we can kind of zoom in on the temporal bone and cross section, we can see that there's a sort of odd looking structure deep within the temporal bone. And the spaces that house this structure is called the bony labyrinth. And then within that, we have the membranous labyrinth. So all of this shown here is the membranous labyrinth, labyrinth which would be within that bony labyrinth. You can see we have different structures like the vestibule, which has semicircular ducts connected as well as a cochlea, which kind of spirals out into something that looks like a snail shell off to the side. Now, all of this membranous labyrinth is associated with the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. And that's gonna help carry some of that sensory information back to the brain. We can process basically hearing and balance information. Now, um, it turns out that between the bony cavity or the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth, there's a little fluid-filled space which is filled with what's called perilymph. Now remember, peri kind of means outside or surrounding, and perilymph is what helps prevent the membranous labyrinth from rubbing up against the bony labyrinth. So it helps protect that membranous labyrinth. Now within the membranous labyrinth, we have endolymph. Remember, endo means within. And it's kind of just like the fluid that you find filling the membranous labyrinth and helping to support it from the inside. Now, uh, we can really divide the uh, bony labyrinth, labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth into three main regions. We have the vestibule, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Remember, the vestibule is sort of the main part of that structure. The semicircular canals, there's three of them, and they project off of the vestibule. And the cochlea was that snail-shaped structure that coiled off to the side. Now, it turns out that the vestibule and the semicircular canals, these are involved in equilibrium or balance. So we'll talk about the vestibular complex which is associated with equilibrium and it involves both of these structures. Now the cochlea is actually not involved with equilibrium. The cochlea is involved with basically hearing because it contains specialized cells that transduce sound waves to action potentials and allow you to become conscious of that sound. Now we talk about our equilibrium system as having this vestibular complex. Now remember, vestibular system is your balance system. So the vestibular complex can, do, can be divided into two main parts. We have the utricle and saccule. And within the utricle and saccule, we have something called the macula, which is the sensory epithelium that's involved in understanding uh, your head's position in space, or basically like the tilt of your head. Now, uh, something that kind of protrudes off of the vestibule are the semicircular ducts and these are involved with understanding the angular velocity of your head like if you move your head around rapidly knowing how rapidly you're moving it and at what angle you're moving it at something else that's also projecting off of the vestibule we have the cochlear duct and that's involved in sound reception now the macula are associated with the utricle and saccule and within them each macula which is associated with the utricle and saccule, you find something called hair cells. And these hair cells are basically like a modified epithelium that have sensory receptors for equilibrium. Now each hair cell has something called a stereocilia and a kinocilium. And these stereocilia, kinocilium 
are little specialized extensions of the cell, kind of like uh, microvilli, that project out into a membranous structure that can move when your head moves. Now we can see this structure here. Again, here's the vestibule. If we can zoom in on the utricle and saccule, within that we have the macula. If we look at an individual macula, well, what we have are the hair cells. You can see these hair cells are kind of unique looking because they have those stereocilia and kinocilium which project up into something called the otolithic membrane. The otolithic membrane is what's attached to the macula and it has some weight to it because within this sort of gelatinous otolithic membrane we have something called otoliths which are calcium carbonate crystals that give some weight to this gelatinous structure. What this means is when you tilt your head it causes, it causes the otolithic membrane to also tilt which causes the stereocilia to also bend and when these stereocilia bend that activates mechanoreceptors which transduce that to action potentials which gets trans transmitted along the vestibular branches of the vestibulocochlear nerve. So really the function of this macula is for head tilt. So um, each utricle and saccule will detect the position of your head because these stereocilia and kinocilia project into the otolithic membrane, which when your head tilts, it causes the otolithic membrane to tilt, which causes those stereocilia to tilt, which helps initiate action potentials to form. So when the head moves, otoliths push on the underlying gelatinous layer, causes the stereocilia to bend, and this translates to linear acceleration of the head, or basically tilt of your head. So what this looks like then, sort of in action, is when your head is upright, sort of in anatomical position, the otolithic membrane isn't bent. It's sort of horizontal um, with the rest of the macula. And due to the forces of gravity, it ha exerts sort of uh, an, uh, an even uh, tilt along the for, uh, edge of this macula. However, once you tilt your head, due to the forces of gravity, it causes this otolithic membrane to move in the direction of gravity. Because the stereocilia and kinocilium are embedded within the otolithic membrane, you can see that they actually bend with the otolith, or with the otolithic membrane. So when your head tilts, all of these little stereocilia and kinocilia, they tilt with it. And once they tilt, it actually generates action potentials within each of these hair cells. So that head tilt gets transduced to action potentials by these hair cells in the utricle and saccule. Now, something that's similar but different in this process of equilibrium uh, involves the semicircular canals. Now, they are continuous with the utricle. However, there, there are three of these, and the reason why they're called semicircular canals is they form semicircles that project off of the vestibule out away into the rest of the bony labyrinth. Now we have anterior, posterior, and lateral canals. You can think of this like X, Y, and Z, which gives us a three-dimensional representation of our head's position in space. Now the receptors within the semicircular ducts uh, help detect rotational movement of the head. So if you move your head around rapidly, they can help detect sort of rotational movement of that. Now, now <coughs> at the opening of each semicircular canal, we have something called the ampulla, which, like the macula, basically has hair cells embedded within a gelatinous layer that, once tilted, helps generate action potentials in those hair cells. So what this looks like is, here's the vestibule again, However, we're not really focusing on the utricle and saccule at this point. We're really focusing on, well, these semicircular canals. You can see them projecting out. Now these are the ducts, which are basically the membranous part. And within the, each of these ducts, you're going to have endolymph. So what happens is that once you tilt your head in a certain way, the endolymph in this semicircular duct will move with the direction of gravity. And if there's enough sort of movement or angular acceleration, it can push on this cupula. Now the cupula can move with the direction of endolymph. And because we have hair cells here that have stereocilia embedded in the cupula, if this cupula gets bent due to the movement of endolymph, then that can help generate action potentials in the hair cells, which can 
transmit to your brain and allow you to become conscious of your head's sort of acceleration in space. Now, those hair cells are embedded in something called the crista ampullaris, which is just basically the epithelium that contains those hair cells for the semicircular ducts. Um, and we can see this process sort of illustrated here where this gentleman's rotating his head, and as he rota rotates his head, the fluid or endolymph in the semicircular ducts helps sort of move along and bend the cupula here. Once that cupula gets bent, the stereocilia get bent, that generates action potentials in the hair cells, which gets transmitted down through um, axons that basically go towards the um, vestibular complexes of your brain. Now, in terms of the vestibular pathways, what happens is that um, axons from the vestibular apparatus, whether it's the uh, macula within the utricle and saccula, or whether it's the uh, crista ampullaris within the semicircular ducts, these have axons that travel to the brainstem, and these axons are necessary for things like reflexive motor activities, for things like eye movements and neck functions, like just keeping your head upright. But these also have axons that get sent to the more conscious brain centers like your cerebellum, thalamus, and cerebral cortex, which allow you to become consciously aware of your head's position in space. That way you can sort of modify and uh, know where your head is located on your neck. Um, now, what we'll do next is basically move on to the structures for hearing. Now remember, in the bony labyrinth, we have the cochlea. And the cochlea has this cochlear duct which coils around and forms a kind of a snail shell-like structure. We can split this cochlear duct into two main chambers, which are fluid-filled. And the function of these fluid-filled chambers is to transmit waves of vibration, vibration, which then can be transduced into sound. What this looks like then is we have our cochlea. It extends off of the vestibule. It will kind of coil around. You can see within the cochlea we have these fluid-filled spaces. They're filled with endolymph. And they're just a, there to help basically support our uh, cochlear duct, which is also a fluid-filled space. Now if we zoom in on this cochlear duct, what we find is something very similar to the vestibular apparatus, where we have the sort of gelatinous membrane, and it's associated with hair cells that have little stereocilia embedded. Now what's different though with this process is that when your head is tilted, it doesn't activate um, these particular hair cells or stereocilia um, because the cochlea is not involved with the vestibular system it's involved with your auditory system so for hearing. Now what's interesting then is that each of these little patches of tectorial membrane are sensitive to specific frequencies of sound. So when a specific frequency of sound gets transmitted to the cochlea it causes a specific patch of tectorial membrane to vibrate which causes specific hair cells to generate action potentials, and that sends information to specific brain regions, which your brain interprets as a specific tone or sound. Now, we can look at this sort of under the microscope with a tectorial membrane. We have our hair cells, our stereocilia embedded within it, which is very similar to our other processes. Now, these have axons that continue out to the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, the spiral organ which contains your cochlear duct, helps detect the movement of endolymph. However, the movement of endolymph here in the cochlea, in our spiral organ, is not due to the movement of your head in space. It's actually due to the movement of fluid due to vibration, which comes from sound waves. Now, there's a thick sensory epithelium that's associated with the tectorial membrane. Sensory epithelium has your hair cells, like we talked about. That's associated with a tectorial membrane that vibrates at specific frequencies of sound. So what this slide shows, it summarizes, is basically the process of sound transduction from air to action potentials in your cochlea. And this is, to me, one of the coolest sensory systems that we have. Now what this is, is basically um, sound waves are basically waves of air pressure that travel through our atmosphere. 
and those sound waves then will travel through our external acoustic meatus. The sound waves will bounce off of the tympanic membrane and cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. That vibrating tympanic membrane will cause the auditory ossicles to vibrate, like the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Once the stapes vibrates, it will vibrate on something called the oval window, which causes endolymph in the cochlea to vibrate. And that vibrating fluid will travel all along the cochlea until it reaches a specific patch of cochlear membrane that is sensitive to that specific frequency. That's when it will cross over and kind of travel back to the round window. Now, what's really interesting about this process is that high frequency sounds are um, sort of picked up by the beginning parts of the cochlea whereas low frequency sounds are picked up by uh, more distal areas of the cochlea. What this means then is that those high frequency sounds, because they're um, picked up by parts of the cochlea which are more proximal to the auditory ossicles, they undergo, undergo a lot more mechanical vibration or stimuli, and they're more often damaged before lower frequency vibration. So typically with sort of age-related hearing loss, individuals will lose their ability to sense high-frequency vibrations because it's more often damaged um, over the course of a lifetime or just hearing loud noises because it's closer to these auditory ossicles. Whereas uh, as you get older, you're more likely to have your lower frequency sounds intact because they're farther away from those auditory ossicles. Now, now what's interesting then is that there's some sort of um, kind of like a homunculus across the length of the cochlea as it's outstretched, where the more proximal parts of the cochlea are sensitive to higher frequency sounds, and the more distal parts of the cochlea, near the apex or the point, are more sensitive to low frequency sounds. Now, what's interesting though is that uh, the auditory pathways share similar pathways to the vestibular pathways, where what happens is, is that once those hair cells bend due to the movement of the tectorial membrane, that generates action potentials within hair cells. Those are carried out of the um, bony labyrinth via the vestibulocochlear nerve, which terminate at the cochlear nuclei of your brainstem. Now the cochlear nuclei then connect to things like your superior olivary nuclei, which are involved with sound localization, as well as the inferior colliculi of your midbrain, which are involved with auditory reflex. There are some axons that also go to the medial geniculate nucleus of your thalamus, which then can transmit that sound information to the temporal lobe, where you can become uh, sort of conscious of that sound. So what this pathway looks like then is auditory information in the form of action potentials travels through the auditory branch of vestibulocochlear nerve back towards the brainstem via the cochlear nucleus which goes and connects to things like superior olivary nuclei of your midbrain as well as, as, well as the inferior colliculi of your midbrain. Um, these are involved in auditory reflex and sound localization. Um, those can connect to the thalamus <clears throat> whereby the axons in the thalamus can send information to the temporal lobe and that can actually connect to your primary auditory cortex, which is where you can actually can become conscious of a particular sound. Now, what's interesting though is that for some forms of sensory neural hearing loss, uh, a cochlear implant can be appropriate. And basically what this cochlear implant is, is we have a transmitter, and this transmitter helps transmit uh, sound information digitally to a receiver that's embedded within the skin of the scalp. Now this receiver has an antenna and another wire called a transmitter lead that goes through the temporal bone, through the middle ear, directly into the cochlea. Once in the cochlea, this wire will coil all through the cochlea. And what's interesting about this wire is that it's been programmed or designed to only shock specific parts of the cochlea due to specific sounds. So that if you hear a specific noise, it's picked up by this transmitter, sends, it sends that to the receiver, receiver sends, sends uh, digital output through this transmitter lead to the cochlea, 
which shocks specific parts of the cochlea so that specific hair cells are activated and that uh, specific um, axons can carry that sound information to the primary auditory cortex and this individual can really regain their sense of hearing even if they have sensory neural hearing loss. So it's actually a really interesting um, technology that, that's available now.